morning, everyone. Cool. Um, I'm reading from 2 Corinthians 3, verse 7 to, to 18. Now, if the ministry that brought death, chiseled in letters on stones, came with glory, so that the Israelites were not able to gaze steadily at Moses' face because of its glory, which was set aside, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry that brought cond condemnation had glory, the ministry that brings righteousness overflows with even more glory. In fact, what had been glorious is not glorious now by comparison because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was set aside was glorious, what endures will be even more glorious. Since then, we have such a hope. We act with great boldness. We are not like Moses, we, who, who used to put a veil over, over his face to prevent the Israelites from gazing steadily until the, end of the, until the end of the glory of what was being set aside. But their minds were, were hardened. For to this day, at the reading of the Old co uh, Covenant, the same veil remains. It is not lifted because it is set aside only in Christ. Yet still today, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We all, we all with unveiled faces are looking as in, as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord, who is the Spirit. I want to start by asking a question today. Two questions, actually. Do you need good news today? Do you long for God's blessing today? I have good news for you. Today. And I can also, with confidence, say that you are blessed, if you are a believer, all because of Jesus and His wonderful work on the cross, which we can still taste in our mouths. If you are listening to this sermon today and you are not a believer, I want you to listen closely to how to receive God's blessing because it is actually available to anyone and everyone. Before we jump into 2 Corinthians, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we can still taste your body and your blood in our mouths. That was an awesome reminder of your love for us, the salvation we have in you, the freedom that comes with that salvation. And it also solidifies our identity as children who are welcome around your table. Thank you for every song that we could have sing, sung. Thank you uh, for a time of fellowship. And thank you that we can open up your word now. A word that we believe is alive. A word that we believe will speak to us. A word that we believe will pierce the innermost parts of our being. A word that can transform us, strengthen us, inspire us, encourage us, and be great news to us today. So, Lord Jesus, I pray that if we need good news today, that that is what we will hear. If we need to receive your blessing today, then that is what we will receive. Anoint my lips. Have me speak only the words that you want me to speak. Open up our hearts. Illuminate our minds, Holy Spirit. Move among us as we read through your word and as we work through it. I pray that in your name. Amen. So our teaching text comes from 2 Corinthians. Now, just because we haven't been in 2 Corinthians for quite some time, let me just show you a map of the book, and let me just give you some context, because I think it's important. This is, again, as always, a map from the Bible Project. Let's start top left. The beginning of the church in, Corinthian, uh, in Corinth, we read about in the book of Acts. The Apostle Paul started the church. And then you'll see in the story of the church, there's quite a trail. So Paul received a report about what's going on in the church. Then he wrote a letter to the church. Then he had a painful visit at the church. And then he wrote this second letter that we are reading from today. So there's some history between Paul and this church. If you look at the next slide, you'll see that the whole chapter 1 to 7 is about Paul who needs to reconcile with the Corinthians. Okay? And it's divided into different sections. This is where we will be at today, and this is chapter 3. So Paul is busy writing to the Corinthians about stuff that they need to talk through. Okay? So we've got some beef. Let me clarify some things. 
And as he reminds them, listen, of the work that Jesus did in them through the Holy Spirit, this is a work of transformation, he says to them actually, hey, listen, you guys changed. And the fact that you guys changed means that the work I did is to be recommended. You guys are my letter of recommendation. While he's busy talking to them about this work that Jesus did in them, he describes in detail just how blessed they are as believers in Jesus, calling them people who are part of the new covenant. Now, just a sidebar here, because covenant isn't a word that we use every single day. A covenant, listen, is an agreement between two parties in which both parties say, I will never, ever, ever, ever break this agreement because the, uh, uh, um, the stakes are too high. Because if we break this agreement, death will follow. The old covenant that God had with His people in the Old Testament was that there was a written law. He committed to giving them everything they needed, and they committed to obeying the law and its commandments. The new covenant is all about the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us and writing the very law of God on our hearts so that we can respond in obedience to everything that God has given us. Okay, So there was an old covenant, the first two-thirds of the Bible, and now the new covenant, the last third of the Bible, into infinity. Now this dense passage, I mean it is a, quite a dense passage, it all comes down to one simple point. Look at verse 18 again, and so we can have that up quickly. We are transformed by looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord. Do you see it? That's what it all comes down to. So I'm telling you now, because that's also where I will land at the end of my sermon. We are transformed, changed from one thing to another. By beholding, that's the Greek word that's translated in this translation as uh, looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord. Can I ask you a question? Have you been transformed recently? And if you have, how? And if you have been transformed, will someone other than you be able to testify to this? Will someone other than you be able to testify to your transformation? Our theme for today is simple. Behold and be transformed. Behold and be transformed. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk us through these seven blessings that you see here, the seven blessings of the new covenant, because they're all great news, and they are all, well, blessings. Look at it with me. What comes with the new covenant? Life, righteousness, permanence, hope, a new heart, freedom, and transformation. And the key word in this whole passage is the word glory. We find glory ten times in verse 7 to 11, and we have it twice in verse 18. We even find it three times in our English translation. It is a glorious passage. Do you guys see what I did there? Playing with words. Okay. Now, when Paul talks about glory, he thinks back of what happened in Exodus 34, and that was Moses meeting God, and God's glory being transferred to Moses, and Moses' face that started shining, because he had a weighty encounter with a weighty person, and he carried some of God's weight with him. It was a glorious moment in the Old Testament. Now, Paul uses that moment, and he says, the Old Covenant had glory, but the New Covenant's glory surpasses it. Now, I already said the New Covenant is the last third of the Bible, the New Testament. The New Covenant, fam, is the age that we are in at the moment. Okay? Creation, fall, Israel, Jesus. That's until we get the book of Acts. And then you've got the church and the spirit, and then you've got restoration and redemption. We are not at restoration and redemption again. We are now here which is the fifth big act of the Bible, the church and the Spirit. The Messiah has come, the, offend, uh, the events of Easter have taken place, Jesus ascended to heaven, the Spirit has been poured out. Going from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant is like going from a donkey cart to a Ferrari. It's quite a shift. It's like going from dial-up internet to fiber. Whoa, do you guys remember dial-up? Beep, 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 beep. Click, loo, click, loo, click, loo. 
and then you had to wait 15 minutes for a web page to load. You guys remember that? Those days are long gone. Hello, fiber optic internet. Like that's the shift. It's, it's not just an upgrade. It's something new that God is doing, and it's glorious, it's awesome, it's undeniable, it's weighty. It is, in South African English vernacular, next level. That's what Paul describes. He says God has done something next level in the new covenant. Now, if you are a Bible nerd and you want to track with me, let me just give you a breakdown of the passage really quickly. Verses 7 to 11 is a section. Paul makes a series of lesser to greater arguments. I'll show you what that means now. And he just shows that the new covenant is better and has more glory than the old one. And then in verse 12 to 17, he contrasts two veils to one another. He speaks about the veil, uh, the veil that Moses had over his face. And then he speaks about a veil over human hearts. And then in the end, he concludes with a statement about this miracle of having the veil lifted and beholding the Lord. Let's start with the first blessing, life. Now, look at the highlights. There's quite a lot of them, but look at the highlight in verse 7. There was a ministry that brought death. It came with glory, but now there's a ministry of the Spirit, and it is more glorious. That's the point that Paul is making. Now, he doesn't say that the commandments and the law we have in the Old Testament are silly or bad, but he says that was a ministry of death. Why? Because firstly, it brought sin to light. It showed us our sin. And this leads to frustration, and it leads to the absence of joy and peace. I mean, fam, who of us, when we realize that we have done something wrong, goes, yes, this is a great feeling. I feel awesome. Joy leaves us and peace leaves us the moment we know our sin. And that's the only thing that the law could ever do to you, is it's a mirror that gets held up to you and all you see is, I'm falling short and I'm filled with sin and I just cannot obey. And because of our sinful nature, the law actually incites us to sin more because, stuff it, I won't be able to do it anyway, ever, so I might just as well continue sinning. Paul says that's the problem with the law. Read Romans chapter 7. And also, the law was a ministry of death because it was powerless to change the human heart. Have you ever read the Old Testament? Have you ever seen the sin of God's people? And how many times God uh, um, uh, um, proclaims His love to His people? And how many times they keep on sinning? Why? Because there's something wrong inside of the humans. It's our sinful nature. And the law couldn't fix that. So the law was written on tablets, and that was good, but it wasn't written on the heart. So if you have external regulations in your faith or in your religion, you have a religion of death. Fam, let me give it to you straight. Christianity is not a to-do list. Christianity is about having a new heart. Do you realize that? All other world religions have lists of rules and do's and don'ts. Christianity is about being made new from the inside out, and it starts with having a new heart. That's why Paul says in verse 8 that the greater glory comes by the ministry of the Spirit. One of the things that the Spirit does to us is He imparts life. Romans 8, verse 1 and 2. We all know the beginning of Romans 8, verse 1. It goes, therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And we all cheer and we say, Amen. Listen to the second part of that verse. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Life, fam. Paul says in Galatians 5, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. The Spirit has given us life, and now the law is written on our hearts. And the Spirit empowers us to glorify God by writing the law of God on our hearts. It's the same Spirit that will raise us in glory. It's the same Spirit that will give us a new body. It's the same Spirit that gives us life now and gives us the life that we will be raised to in the future. 
This is real life. It's a life filled with vitality and joy. It is a life that you can see. It is a life that you can experience. It is a life free from condemnation. It is a life in partnership with the Spirit or in step with the Spirit. It is a life in which God does something new on the inside. It is a life in which you experience a power that is not from within you, but that comes from the outside. It is a life filled with praise, right? You open up your eyes and you say, praise God for all you see and all you have. It is a life of hope. You don't get discouraged. All of this that I mentioned and more comes with the ministry of the Spirit. Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you have an experience of this, fam? Because I have to tell you as your pastor, do you know how many times I hear we are tired? Do you know how many times I hear we are overwhelmed? Do you know how many times I hear we are strained, frustrated, defeated, discouraged? Good news, there's life for you. And it comes with the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever seen an advertisement on the telly about medicine? There's someone who sits there looking like death, eyes swollen and teary, nose all red, box of tissues. And then the advertisement says, try this. This will help for that. That's exactly what the ministry of the Spirit is. Because if you're caught up in a cycle of death, or you are defeated or discouraged or strained or overwhelmed, this will help. It is a blessing that is given to us, part of the new covenant. And you can't earn it, you just need to receive it. Life, fam, life. Second one, righteousness. The book of James, the half-brother of Jesus, says, If you fail at one point in the law, if you break one, you've broken it all. Okay, so that's kind of a tough spot to be in. Guilty. Don't know about you guys. Thank you for being dishonest. I'm trying to be honest here. Before. No, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. Guilty. And all of us know that you can't try and save yourself by trying to keep the law because that will kill you. Because you simply can't. Because if you break one, you've broken them all. We go to Christ for our salvation. Now here's what I want you to see. Look at the highlights. A ministry that brought condemnation. And a ministry that brings righteousness. The one had glory, the next one is a Ferrari. It's just much, much better. Fam, this is a state that you are in every single day. You are either in a state of condemnation or you are in a state of righteousness. And the new covenant, the ministry that comes with the new covenant, brings righteousness. Listen to this, two Fs, freely and fully in Christ. Paul uses this word righteousness seven times in 2 Corinthians. I think the, probably the highlight place where he uses it is in 2 Corinthians 5.21. Where he says, look, you've got innocent and you've got guilty. Here's what happened on the cross. Swap. That's it. Guilty became innocent. Innocent became guilty. Period. Not a little innocent, a little guilty, and not a little guilty, a little innocent. Straight swap. Right there. It is a legal declarative act. Not guilty. That's the gospel. Think about this. I'm in the witness stand. I'm being absolutely battered and condemned. And someone comes to me and says, you can now exit the witness stand. I shall sit there in your place. What is the declaration about me? Not guilty. There is a guilty, but someone took it in my place. That's the good news of Jesus Christ is that He paid for all of our sin. He paid it in such a way that God's wrath was satisfied, which means that He paid it fully and forever through His death. And through His resurrection, He opens up a whole new way of life, a way of life that we now have access to, and I just spoke about that. The righteousness that God requires from us Now, in the gospel, is the very uh, righteousness that God provides for us through Jesus Christ. Do you guys see that? So God wants something from us, and then He provides that for us, so that we can have it, so that we can be uh, reconciled to Him. Apart from the gift of righteousness in Christ, received by faith, it's a gift, we need to grip it, we need to receive it, we are left on our own. 
and we uh, need to save ourselves, which we can't do. I mean, think about it. How are you going to try and save yourself? Have you ever thought about that? I'm just going to be an ostrich. I'm going to deny that I ever did anything wrong. Do you think that's going to work? It's not going to work. How about believing that your good works will outweigh your bad ones? And then you're okay. That'll probably work when you did like one good work in a week. But it's definitely not enough. We can't beat ourselves and tell ourselves how bad we are and then hope that that would work. None of that will work. It'll all come up short. Because none of it will satisfy the wrath of God. And it definitely won't fulfill or free you. Look at these lyrics from a, a, a hymn called Before the Throne of God Above. I love this. Check this, fam. This is what we do. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free for God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. To look on him and pardon me. The gospel is not an invitation to do great things for God. It's a declaration of what God has done for us. Do you guys understand that? It is a gospel of grace. It is a gift that was given to us. It's something that we need to receive. The best exhortation or encouragement that I can give you this morning when we speak about righteousness is to wake up in the morning and think about what God has done for you in Christ. I promise you now, fam, that'll make all the difference. Think about what he did in the past. Think about what he's currently doing for you. And then you live out of that grateful heart. That should be the very first thing that comes to mind when you open your eyes in the morning. And I promise you, if you live out of that with a grateful heart, you'll actually end up doing many great things for God. Righteousness, right standing with God and with others. What a joy. What a joy. I mean, all of us have a stomach that turns when we know that we are, if we've got beef with someone. Imagine how you must feel if you know you've got beef with God. And just imagine how beautiful the story of the gospel is then. Because it says the beef is cleared. It's done. Let's look at number three. This is a quick one, but it's a really important one. Permanence. Look at verse 10 to 11. I've got some highlights there for you. It'll come up to the screen now. Once again, something had been glorious, but it was set aside because now there's something that will endure and it'll be even more glorious. Paul says, the old age was indeed glorious, right? I mean, Israel had quite a good bat at it. They had wonderful privileges and they carried wonderful blessings. But the new covenant believers surpasses the privilege and the blessings that Israel had. Now, how great and comforting and encouraged and awesome is it to know, guys, that the reality that we are living in now as believers, this is it. Like, it's not going to get better. God has got one move left, and that move is the redemption and the restoration of all things. There are no other moves for God to do anymore. He poured out His Spirit. We, we live in the best time that you could possibly live in the history of the world because we're filled with hope. And we are filled with certainty of what is to come. Think about that. The people in the old covenant knew that something was coming. They had descriptions from the prophets about how this is going to happen. But they didn't know when and, and, and how and who. But we know all of that. It was written and it happened. The new one is designed to last forever. Nothing material that we have can last forever. Nothing that you do will ever last forever. Nothing that you are, nothing that you leave behind will ever last forever. Have you guys ever bought a product and then they say, this product has got a lifetime guarantee? Do you know why it has a lifetime guarantee? Because it can't last forever. <laughs> so they, 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 they say that it can last forever, but then they slip the guarantee in there just for in case it doesn't last forever. Because nothing lasts forever except, except this permanent new covenant. And this blessing that God has given us, this life and this righteousness that we've spoken about will not change. It cannot change. It's not circumstantial. It's not subject to change. What a blessing. It will last forever. We need to hear this, believers and non-believers. What we have put our faith in is permanent. And it will never, ever, ever change. 
Let's look at number four, hope. That's another blessing that comes with the new covenant. Look, the believers in the Old Testament, rightly, had hope in God's promises and in His mercy. But the new covenant brought greater clarity and greater assurance of all that God was going to do and will do. Why? Because His great salvation act already played off in front of the eyes of people and it was written down to us and God revealed it to us and we put our faith in it and we were saved accordingly. Okay, so what do we hope for? What do we hope for? We hope for new bodies. We hope for new creation. We hope for a time where there's no pain. We hope for a time where there's no sickness, where there's no death. A time in which we receive our inheritance, right, as heirs of God. We hope for a time that we see Jesus himself. And if I don't stop myself now, I can continue and continue and continue. We actually have something really solid that we hope in. The New Testament, if you just read through it, is filled with glorious declarations about this hope. And it fills us with confidence now. In December of 2010, I spent 21 days in Washington State in the United States. And I read through the New Testament three times in those 21 days. And I saw this. And it's never left my head or my heart. The fact that what we hope for is just glorious. You see what I did there? Did it use the word glory again? But this time not in a joke, in an exhortation. This hope, fam, should speak to all of our feelings and all of our emotions. Pastor Joby Martin of the Church of 1122 always says that emotions and feelings are not bad things because they help us to navigate life, but they do lie more often than not. We can't trust our feelings. We can't trust our emotions. And we definitely can't put our faith in our feelings or in our emotions. So this hope should reform our feelings and our emotions. Are you fearful? Well, this hope should give you confidence because you know where the future is headed. Nothing can happen to us here that can undermine what God has in store for us. Do you feel lonely? Well, let this hope bring you a sense of nearness to the Lord because you know that the day is at hand in which we will be with Him in His full manifestation and in His full glory. I mean, I think it's unfathomable, and I think it's indescribable for us. But if we feel lonely, this hope should help us. Are you angry? Are you angry? Because this hope definitely calms you down. It puts things into perspective. Because it doesn't matter what you're angry at, it's going to change. And God's going to make it new. Are you sad? Well, this hope should bring you joy. Because look at what is coming, right? The best is yet to come. Tony Merida of, the, uh, uh, of uh, Imago Day Church in Raleigh always says that as believers, we can't be closer to hell than we are now. <laughs> like this is the worst life could probably get because what lies ahead is the best. And the best is yet to come. Do, we, do you feel hurt? Well, let this hope of glory bring you a sense of healing. Why? Because all things will be made new. And all shattered and broken hearts will be healed. Do you feel bitter? Well, allow this hope to make you gracious and forgiving as you consider how you have not earned any of this. It was all a gift of grace given to you. Do you feel shame? And do you struggle with shame? Do you feel shameful about who you are? Well, let this hope of glory bring you a sense of honor. Why? Because you are God's beloved child. You are dressed in the righteousness of Christ. Oh, what a glorious, glorious moment. You don't have to feel shameful about anything. This is the hope we have. And Paul says, while we have this hope, look at verse 12b. We act with great boldness. We've got great confidence. Because we know in the end, Jesus wins. And all who are in Him will win. That's why we don't hide our message. We're bold about our message. We are transparent about our message. We are honest about our message. Why? Because the message of the gospel is the best news in the world. Why on earth would you want to hide it? Think of 
re-watching a sports game where your team won a championship and then having someone watch it with you for the first time. Oh, it's a glorious feeling. I mean, think about it. The Rugby World Cup final, 2019, South Africa versus England. We won, just in case you don't know. And you are watching the game, knowing how it's going to end, and then showing it to this person for the first time, going, dude, listen, it's going to be epic. Okay, there will be moments in which you think that it's in the balance, but it's not, dude. Well, champs, let's enjoy. I want to share this experience with you. That's the same way that we should share the gospel with other people, with that boldness. Not veiling the glory, but declaring the glory. I want to ask you a question. Do you declare the good news to people? Like, do you share the good news with people? When I spoke about the Springboks now, some of you got excited. I also saw some of you went, oh, rugby metaphors. Dude, I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. I grew up loving rugby. I stayed up late last night to watch the rugby. I'm that guy. My bad, my bad, my bad. And when you declare this good news to people, do you have hope? We need hope in this country at the moment. And we carry that message. No journalist, no news channel, no bull in parliament, no political party will bring us hope. I promise you that. But we have it. Right? No one needs to bring it to us. We need to take it to others. Let's look at number five. The fifth blessing with a new covenant. A new heart. Let's look at verse 14 to 16. Now, you don't have to be a Jew to have this so-called veil over your heart, right? Paul is now talking here about that which characterizes all of us who are bound up in religion apart from Christ, okay? Paul is talking about everyone who hasn't put their trust, who haven't put their trust in Jesus. Paul says that their minds were hardened. Do you see the highlight there in verse 14? Now, minds, fascinating word in the Greek text. You guys know that the New Testament was written in Greek, so this letter was written in Greek. The word that is used here for minds in Greek is the same word that Paul uses in chapter 2 to talk about Satan's designs. So he connects the lies that Satan designs with our minds. That actually had some rhyming in there. I wasn't planning on that, but it sounded cool. And then all the other times where Paul uses this word in 2 Corinthians, he is associating it with spiritual warfare. So the point that Paul is making is there's something happening in here that keeps the truth from going from here to here. The problem is not the law. The problem is the human heart doesn't receive the law. It gets stuck here. Your mind is hardened. And this is also where Satan attacks you. Do you guys remember vending machines? Hey? Chirps, chocolates, wine gums, Coke, Fanta, cream soda, all the rest. And then you've got a selection, D6. And then you have to put in your money in a slot in the top. Do you guys remember it? And then when you put in your money, it goes, clunk, 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 and you see those lays lightly salted. Come to me, come to me, and it drops down. Do you guys remember when you, when you put the coin in a vending machine, and it stays in the coin slot? It helps absolutely nothing. Like, it is in there, but then you go, duh, 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 to get it down. Because it needs to go through the coin slot, all the way down into the coin box, otherwise you don't get your stuff. Some of you actually gestured. <laughs> oh, always at school. Boys, what are you doing? Uh, sorry, sir. It's just the foxy necks didn't come, you know. That's the problem with having knowledge about God, but it not coming through to your heart. Your heart will not be made new. And everything you have in here will be absolutely useless. So you know that bash dish, dish, that gets the coin down? That's what Christ does. Paul says that veil is lifted. It goes through the mind into the heart and makes the heart new. Because of the spiritual blindness of these people, they read the Old Testament, which does declare the gospel, but there was a veil over their minds, and there was a veil over their hearts. They didn't understand it, and many people still don't. Why? Because there's a veil over their hearts. 
Now in verse 16, Paul says, I want you to see that, uh, the veil is removed. So someone else removes it, right? Moses removed his own veil back in Exodus, but here the veil is removed. It's something that the Lord does in us. He removes it from our eyes. Think of many stories in the Bible. Someone like Lydia in Acts 16. Think of Paul in Acts chapter 9. Think of your own story. There was a moment in your own story where you could see clearly. Where the veil was lifted from your own eyes and your own heart. You know full well that God keeps on tugging and tugging and pursuing and pursuing and pursuing and coming after our hearts and minds. And then there's this one day where you go, I just have to put my faith in this. That's when the Lord lifts the veil. We should ask the Lord to do this for us. And we should ask the Lord to do this for other people. Because do you see that it happens whenever a person turns to the Lord? That's probably the most joyous thing to say in an evangelism conversation. People would say to you, how would I know? How would I know? How would I know? How would I know? Do you know what I tell them? Just turn to the Lord and then you'll know. <laughs> like You can't have everything sorted out before you believe. It is a leap of faith, but trust in that leap of faith. I can testify of it. I took that leap of faith without knowing everything, but now I know. Still not everything, but I know. That is to be trusted because the Lord removed the veil. Let's look at number six. We're getting there. How are you guys doing? We're doing all right. I know a seven point sermon is hard. I usually do a three point sermon. Okay? And I also know that some of you panicked when I showed seven points because you were like, oh, we're going to be here for two hours. We won't. We're getting there. But stay with me. Six one, freedom. Oh, look at verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Oh, oh, oh. Do you guys remember that song, Freedom? We sung it so many times with Meryl here. It's a rapper. It's a rapper. But it's the truth. Now, there's a beautiful Trinitarian theology in this passage. We see God, the Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit, working in harmony, right? Creating the work of salvation. And this, these verses, well, especially verse 17 and then 18, uh, shows the deity of Christ and the Spirit, meaning Jesus is God and the Spirit is God, and they are all one God in three different persons, and they are united in their work together. Okay? So we see Christ and the Spirit in this verse operating together because they are both gifts of the new age. Think about it. Creation, fall, Israel, uh, Jesus, the church and the Spirit. This is the gift of the new age, both the Savior and His Spirit with us. The Spirit unites us to Christ. Now let's talk about freedom quickly. Let's talk about freedom. It's interesting, if you read this verse in the Greek, it says, and where the Spirit of the Lord, freedom. Like those three words are gone in Greek. Where the Spirit of the Lord, freedom. Awesome, Paul. Yeah, nice one. Mm, mm, Good stuff. Freedom from what? Like we need to define this. It's freedom from guilt, fam. It's freedom from condemnation. It's freedom from fear. It's freedom from death. And it's not only freedom from, but it's also freedom for. It is freedom for obedience. It is freedom to have the power to do what God says. It's not a freedom to do whatever you want to do. It is a freedom to obey God. That's real freedom. Because sin and death, left to your own devices, only brings slavery. I think I should call in Jesus at this moment. Let me show you. John 8, verse 31 to 32. We all know... Verse 32, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Amen. Come on, come on, come on. Look at the highlight in verse 31. If you continue in my word. That's really important. So yes, we will know the truth. And yes, the truth will set us free. But we'll know the truth and the truth will set us free if we continue in God's word. So freedom is not about the ability to do what you want. Freedom is about the ability to do what God wants us to do. 
Yesterday in this beautiful part of Centurion, we had the Spar Women's Challenge, right? 20 edition, a 5K and a 10K. It was awesome. Both races crossed the street that we lived in, or that we live in, so we went to watch the race. I also love running races. Here's the amazing thing about a race. Check this. You've got marshals, and you've got traffic officers, and you've got an official route. It's all there. You don't have to think about it. You are free to run. You can cross a red traffic light. You can run on the right side of the road. You can run on the left side of the road. You don't have to wonder, am I still in the right place? Because there'll be someone with a flag going, 10 Ks, turn right, 10 Ks, turn right, 10 Ks, turn right. It's marvelous to love a race. It's marvelous to run a race that is an official race. Why? Because you have the sense of freedom. Someone sorted out all the boundaries for you. Now you can run like a champ. A training run isn't the same. Every single day I go on a training run. I have to watch when I get to intersections and crossings. I have to be mindful of all the cars. I have to think of my route. I have to think of my time. It's, it's not really, I mean, it is fun. But it's not as free as in a race. Where you know every two and a half Ks, there'll be someone going, last one, last one, born to run, last one, booty. And you'll have water and you'll have potatoes and bananas. Oh, it's abundance. When I run on my own, it's quite dry. You know what I mean? So we are made free, but there's still a race to run. Do you guys get that? But we can run it with real freedom. Let's look at the last one, transformation. Now, remember the first six things we mentioned up until this point. And so can we just have that one slide on again, please? The seven blessings. Let's recap. So it's important to see life, righteousness, permanence, hope, new heart, and freedom. The reason why I want you to see those first six is because real transformation happens when we, look at those, when we look at those things every single day. I spoke about beholding leads to becoming. Well, what do you behold? What do you intently look at? You look at those six things. Why? Because we know that what we admire and what we adore is what we become. That's why I asked you the question, whose mannerisms did you pick up? That's what question of the day was all about. And let me just put this to you. There is no more admirable person in the universe to admire and adore than Jesus Christ. And that's how we change. Is we behold Him and we look at Him. Experience won't change us. Self-help books won't change us. Moralism won't change us. What Paul says here is very important, and that is, behold the beauty of Christ and be changed by the Spirit. Now, our translation, can I have verse 18 again, please? Our translation says, as looking in a mirror, or looking as in a mirror. Guys, how do you look in the mirror? You look intently. It's not just a quick glance. I mean, you guys must see me floss, right? Lips open. Eyes squinting, I go closer to the, closer to the mirror oh, to make sure that it's all in there. Ladies, if you do makeup, or well, some of the gents, I don't know, maybe. If you do your hair, you don't just glance at it, you look and you look a little bit closer to see if everything is there and all right. You look intently. That's what Paul says. If we look at what Jesus did for us, if we behold Jesus, if we adore Jesus, if we savor Jesus, it will change us. And that's our biggest need. All of us is to change by beholding the glory of God. Are you dwelling on Christ? Are you intently looking at who He is and at what He did? Because if you do, you'll change. Think about this. You look at Jesus eating with sinners and scoundrels and dirty people in his time, and all of a sudden you become more loving towards others. Do you see it? That's transformation. If you look at Jesus weeping over Jerusalem, you become more compassionate for the brokenness of this world. As you see Jesus preaching boldly, even to the religious elite, right, the so-called clever guys of his time, we become more bold as we share the gospel with other people. 
Look at Jesus loving kids. When we really look at that, we become tender and we become gentle. Look at Jesus suffering without saying anything in return except forgive them for they know not what they do. Here we go. Just look at this. And when you do, all of a sudden, you learn how to endure hardship and persecution. If we look at Jesus saying forgive them, we become more forgiving. If we look how Jesus gave up everything for our salvation, we become more generous, fam. Generosity comes from the gospel, not from a great sales pitch. Generosity comes from you realizing that God gave it up all for you. As we see Jesus rising from the dead, and we know that the resurrection is true, we become more firm in our faith. As we see how Jesus restores Peter and shows mercy on him, we become more merciful. Read Revelation 1 again. Look at Jesus, the exalted Christ. Fam, he's got eyes of fire. And he's got feet of bronze. He's not to be trifled with. So when you read about the exalted Christ, all of a sudden you become more pure because those eyes of fire can see everything and those feet of bronze are unshakable and they're not moving. So I need to change when I behold Him. Do you guys see how it works? And here's the key. Here's the key. If you missed everything I said in the last 43 minutes, listen to this. Being transformed is something that God does to you. It's called a present passive. It happens now, but it happens by someone else. Do you guys see it? Are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, which means a next level glory. And as we gaze on Christ, as we look at Him, we are transformed into His image. Fam, do you want to grow? Do you want to grow? Because if you do, Jesus Christ and gazing on Him and beholding them is where you start. And you'll actually become the person you were created to be. Do you see the word image? All of your Bible chains were supposed to be yanked there because it harks back to Genesis 1. We were created in God's image. And now He says we are being transformed into that same image of Christ. We are becoming who He created us to be. Behold and be transformed. The seven blessings that comes with the new covenant. Life, righteousness, permanence, hope, a new heart, freedom, transformation. Which one of these do you need to be formed in you? We need to decide this now. You can't hear the gospel and not make a decision. Which one of these is good news to you today? Because when I asked if you need good news, many of you went like this. So which one of these are good news to you? Which blessing do you long for today? Let's pray. Father God, we sang earlier that you are a good, good Father. We sang earlier that you have been so, so good to us. And once again, Father God, we read in this chapter how you've blessed us. Thank you for giving us life. Thank you for giving us righteousness. Thank you for giving it to us permanently. Thank you for giving us hope. Thank you for giving us new hearts. Thank you for giving us freedom. Thank you for transforming us into your spirit, Lord, oh, into your image, Lord Jesus. I pray that you would that you would do these things in us. I pray that you would form these things in us. I pray that we would receive this as good news today. I pray, Lord Jesus, that our response would be that, we're going to, uh, that which we are going to sing now, and that is that we are willing for you to make new wine in us. May your name be glorified, Lord Jesus, as we are transformed by your Spirit. I pray that in your name. Amen. Thank you.